Okay, hello everybody. Um, it's 11.15, so we'll get started. Uh, I'm Brian Brown, I'm the Weed Management Specialist with New York State IPM. And uh, this is uh, a very snowy day, unfortunately. We had some, some, uh, some struggles uh, bringing Alvaro in person uh, to Cornell. Uh, so he's currently stuck uh, in Newark um, on his, and uh, we'll be heading back home uh, later this afternoon, hopefully uh, with no more further delays. But thank you everyone for coming. This is our, our first uh, New York State IPM academic seminar of the spring semester. We've been doing this for a couple of years and, and uh, the general goal is of the series is to increase awareness of new research and techniques that advance IPM and its adoption in all types of management settings. Um, uh, we, we host these seminars roughly monthly. Our, our next two speakers are Kayo Brunaro, uh, we're talking about weed, weed management, and Justin Rankma, we'll talk about insect pests in strawberries and apples. Um, and we're, we're kind of uh, broadcasting today from, um, from, from Ithaca campus, where I'm looking outside, it's very snowy. Um, and I want to um, acknowledge that uh, Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gaiocono, uh, members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and uh, contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gaiocono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection uh, of Gaiocono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. Uh, for more information, check out the University the, um, Indigenous Dispossession website. Uh, so. Now it brings me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Alvaro Romero, who's an assistant professor in urban entomology at New Mexico State University. His work combines urban entomology, chemical ecology, toxicology, and animal behavior. Specifically, he researches insects of urban environments, serves as an educator and mentor to future students or future scientists in this, in this field and serves as a bridge with minority groups in providing information on identification, biology, and effective ways to prevent and reduce the impact of urban pests. Uh, in particular, he's worked with uh, Turkestan cockroaches, uh, kissing bugs, and what we'll hear about today, uh, bed bugs. So uh, welcome, Alvaro. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me well? Yes, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Brown and Dr. Calisto for the invitation. Thanks for the introduction. I think we're going to go ahead and share this. All right, today I'm going to talk about integrated pest management for bed bulk. What's new? I'm going to show some information that I think is very important to highlight when we talk about bed bugs. Initially, I'll be talking about the resurgence of the box, a, a little bit of historical background of, of this urban pace, why we consider the box today the perfect storm, how uh, also the problematic of the box in low income housing that has become a nightmare for many. I'll be also presenting concepts about embracing IPM and, and even the challenges that we have when we talk about IPM for the box. I also want to emphasize in this presentation about some alternative residual insecticides. I'll be talking about that and a biological tool that we have now available. And I would like to wrap up my conference and talking about the community wide bed bug management program, which is a concept that has been, let's say, introduced in bed bugs. And I'm going to discuss a little bit about this. I would like to start my talk uh, showing this picture. This, uh, this, this photo. And this photo show that bed box has has had with us for for many for 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 many years and and this show uh, this photo is from a century ago and it illustrate how difficult was bed, the bed box control during that time that was considered 
uh, typically a, a word against bed bugs, uh, but that time there were not very many tools to control bed bugs. There was cyanide gas and kerosene and all these things that they were extremely dangerous. So definitely this show, this picture show how difficult or uh, uh, the hard time that they had to control this pest. And with the discovery of DDT in, in, the, decade, in the, de the decade of the 40, it, it was considered the golden area of pesticide. The, the discovery of DDT pretty much changed the history of bed bug control. There was a potent insecticide. It has a very strong residual action, and there was a liberal application of this insecticide. You can notice here uh, people applying this insecticide pretty much everywhere. So <laughs> that was kind of the solution by that time for bed bugs and only for bed bugs, also for, for many other pests like flies, mosquitoes, lice, and all that. So definitely it was a, a game changer for this, for many of these pests. And um, pretty much in many parts of the world, because of the use of the thing, bed bugs disappeared, not everywhere, but in many places. It's important to say that by that time, the use of a single application of the thing was enough to keep at bay infestations and they 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 didn't need to reapply this insecticide that often and that's something that we have learned and and with this picture i want to i want to indicate that definitely this type of insecticide that they have residual action that they are safe that they should be safe as well might be let's say the 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 solution of course for for, for bed bug control <clears throat> something that we don't have today i'm going to mention later and you all know that this uh, has been in since 20, since 200, a global and sudden resurgence of, of a forgotten pest global because pretty much happened everywhere at the same time. That's a very, very crude situation in America, in, in Europe, in Africa, in Australia, and all that. So definitely uh, bed bugs came out suddenly <clears throat> in within within five years. And we, I mentioned uh, forgotten pest because uh, Literally, nobody was working with bed bugs for, nobody worked for bed bugs for decades. And even entomologists didn't know about how bed bugs looked like. And, and of course, there was no uh, research completed during many decades. And when this problem came back, we know very much. We, we had colonies to work with, and there was a chaos because people didn't know how to manage this place. I also want to mention with this slide that Bed bugs today have become the most challenging urban pest to control in urban environment, of course. Bed bugs have researched in many places, in higher scale hotels, in apartment buildings, in, in residences, in nursing homes, in dormitories, pretty much all dormitories, university dormitories today have reported bed bugs, and that has been a big problem too. Second hand, where they uh, recycle uh, mattresses and all this kind of material. This is a problem too. Subway has been reported, laundry mats, and theaters, libraries. There are many places. So pet bugs can be present in any place and pretty much everybody is vulnerable to get an infestation of bed bugs. <clears throat> Why the situation of bed bugs? Unfortunately, this is the report for 2018 with Dr. Mike Porter in Kentucky, the National Pest Management Association, they survey people, and the uh, pest control professional reported, 97% of pest control professional reported that they were treating uh, for bed bugs, and almost 70% indicated that bed bug service work was increasing. But if you understand that, 66, almost 60% reported that bed bugs were the most difficult pest to control. And there are roaches, and they also reported that for these other pests, there are tools, there are procedures, there are protocols to control, there are baits uh, for these pests. But in the case of bed bugs, we don't have very many options. So here is when things get so complicated. Now people might be asking what happened during the pandemic time. And they report that somehow bed bug infestation has slowed down because there was a very, uh, uh, the social interaction was reduced. But now people are seeing that they are coming back and they are resurging again, let's say, to the levels of pre-pandemic levels. So that's what I mean. All right. I would like to use this term, the perfect store for bed bugs, something that was coined by Dr. Mike Porter from the University of Kentucky. And the idea here is to show that we are dealing 
with a, path, a unique path with very unique biological, physiological, ecological characteristics, and also social economical characteristics, the infestations. And I want, I'm going to try to show why definitely we had to address this path in a very unique way. And, and in that way, I can show the challenge that you have, we have in this environment. I have to start saying that they are small, even though we can see them. You can see here in this picture, the life stages and all that. The sign is three and a quarter inch. The adults, this is an unfed female and fed in a uh, fed female. And notice here the egg, the egg is one millimeter. And this is a first instar compared with the head of the pin. They are very small. And also all these nymphs are very small and they can fit, they can hide in crevices and cracks. Many times it's very or literally impossible to detect these insects. This insect because they are very small and there are many places where they can hide. So this is an important challenge that we have here with the biology. They are excellent hitchhikers. They have the appendages and all this ability to get a ride in a camera case like this one, in a shoe where you see here circle our egg, their nymphs there, also in the shoe sole here, this is a nymph. Once we visited a place, so they can hang go in many, hang in many of these places. And of course, the most, perhaps the most common case is uh, through luggages and also transportation and secondhand uh, mattresses and, and box print. That's the way we transport and we transfer all these bed dogs from one place to another. What they get inside, there are many places. This is the, the heaven for bed dogs because of the size, a quarter inch, they are flat. So they can hide anywhere, they can hide, and they can hide behind this headboard, behind this frame, in this chair, in the baseboard, and the structure of the bed, like box print, mattress. There are many places where they can hide. Definitely, there are many places. We believe that in the early infestation, they locate primarily around the bed and then they spread, but that's not always the case. So sometimes there is an early infestation, and they can be in other places. Here there is a nymph, this is in, in New Mexico, and there was a nymph in this box print. We removed this flap here of this uh, dust cover, and there was a nymph. If you don't do this, you are not gonna, you are gonna miss it. And that nymph can create a problem. So uh, this is to highlight definitely that they're small and they can hide anywhere. And this is uh, the box print, the structure of box print. There are some skin and some alive bed box. This is the frame. It's a frame and they were bed bugs. If we don't remove, we don't do a careful inspection, well, we're gonna miss this individual. Here in this case, fortunately it's a male, but in many cases it can be a female and they are the product of female and the uh, infestation can perpetuate by the presence of an individual who can be inseminated and have plenty of food, I mean blood. <laughs> This study showed that definitely, yes, they are bed bugs, they are called bed bugs, but have been reported bed bugs away from the sleeping areas. Notice here, this, there was a, a survey among pest control people and, this, and who responded about the distribution. No, sorry. There was a truly survey of many people who were working on bed bugs, and there was a, a was asked about the distribution of bed bugs in an in infested place. And notice that almost 70% of the bugs were found in, in the mattress the box print and frame and headboard, 70%. But the rest were away from the sleep areas, like chair, dresses, walls, and other places. That represents a challenge because we have to do inspection in places in the sleeping area and also away from the sleeping areas. This is a recliner chair, and this place was infected with bed bug one and showing here some bed bug. There were some nymph on X. This individual, this was in New Mexico, this individual was sleeping or they were he was spending most of the day watching soap operas and we didn't find bed bugs in her in his bed. It was in the recliner. So that is important to understand that they are bed bugs, but they can be anywhere in the place. Electric outlets need to remove because there is an excellent place. There is no very much light there and they lie, like, and we need to treat that place. We need to do a thorough inspection and identify those. Ornament like this basket, there are feces here and we do a zoom, we're gonna see photos. We're gonna see a photo, uh, this is gonna be a photo with, with nymph 
and they are bioponic. If we miss this and we don't treat this piece, of this item, well, we're going to have a problem because they are going to come. They're going to come out later and feed on on the host. A woman purse. This is a woman purse, and there were some bed bugs here. We had to do something with this, otherwise we are missing these populations and we are not solving the the issue. Also, it's important to mention that lion infestations are often difficult, and I will say impossible many times. It requires two people, a nice flashlight, time, and it's time consuming, and that's something that we we face uh, with bed bug infestation, that they are sometimes, it seems that they are not bed bugs, but, but we can say we don't we didn't see bed bugs. It doesn't mean that they, they don't exist. That, that's something important to mention. As far as inspection, is still visual inspection, the most common method to find bed bugs has been demonstrated. And Dr. Shanglu, uh, one from Rugger University, uh, they had they had done a big deal of work with interceptors, which had placed under the leg bags and uh, had been demonstrated that they are inexpensive, they are effective tool for monitoring pre and post treatments. So they show they show data they they more effective than visual inspection, especially when the the number of bed bugs are very low, and they have demonstrated that you combine visual of visual say visual inspection with trap that's going to be more effective. They also have demonstrated that using these interceptors <clears throat> massively deploying massively they might reduce bed bugs. Especially in especially in a small small infestation, so that's something that for low income housing, this can be an excellent tool. You cannot put this in a hotel room like the one I'm here, <clears throat> but but definitely this is an important tool chip that can be used. Also, canine detection has been introduced, has been used. There are the industry using animal life. They are using for termite detection and explosives and all that and has been demonstrated that, yes, yeah, they can be affected by studies show that there is high variation in detection accuracy, and there are many false positive, false negative. So this is not a panacea, and yeah, they can be useful, especially in very specific environment, like hotels, theater, the multi-unit housing, but we need to we need to see what people are doing, how they are treating the animals, the training, retraining of these dogs, all that. So. We need to be careful with this thing. We need to hire good companies to do this job. So in conclusion, yes, inspection is a very important component here for monitoring pre and post treatment. And, and, and unfortunately, there are no many, there are no many other detection methods that we can use that are highly effective. We need to go with the best visual inspection and interceptor. There are many other commercial commercial tools and all that, but many of these devices that have been advertised or have been, have been advertised in internet, unfortunately, they have not been tested in the field in, in the situation where we need they work, where is, when there is a very low infestations. They have been tested in heavy infestation and that doesn't work. I mean, we need to have something that detect early infestations because that's, that they, that they deal. So in that way we, we, we can do a, a, a early treatment and the problem is going to be solved easier. More severe infestation that we all are aware of this is in these places in socially disadvantaged household. household. This is in Cincinnati. Uh, well, I'm pretty sure many of you have seen these cases in places, the mattresses, but please, heavily loaded with, in, with bed bugs, and there are many people there living with these bed bugs, not receiving very, uh, very much help. And this is definitely a nightmare, and it, it is one of the most complex environments to control bed bugs. And why? Because there are low report infestation from residents, and there is a stigma associated. There are many of them are elderly. They don't want that their privacy is not invaded, and there are many social type of thing that a uh, uh, um, psychological thing that happened there that the report that low uh, that there is a low report of infestation we all are aware that it's limited budget for this pest control in this environment social behavior resident something like clutter this is a nightmare because clutter definitely interfere with detection and control effort how do you start to control the box in these situations we will ask people to prepare. We are, who is going to do the preparation? Do we need to prepare this? 
I mean, this is something, this is a real problem. I mean, how, and again, we had to go back to the ecology and biology of this book, and they can be literally anywhere. And this definitely become a big problem that we need to try to solve, and we need to be practical. We'll say preparation, but who do that, who pay that? That's something that we had to think about. It both can be treated, can be controlled, can be eliminated in brackets, but social behavior, social habits, people have it range. It can be, bedbugs can be reintroduced the very next day when they were controlled in these places. That's something that we need to work on. Lack of awareness about, the, about residents and staff, and that's a chronic problem. And I think that we have improved a lot educating people so they know exactly how bedbugs look like, what to do, what not to do, because I think the beginning of IPM. Another problem that we have the infestation are very difficult to eliminate after multiple treatments, and there are not very many pests that require a multiple treatments for pet bugs. That's something that has been demonstrated, and it's very common to see pet bugs resting in surfaces that have been previously treated. That's very common, and this is kind of an indication that the insecticide is not working. And the other problem we have is that there are no, no, there are no very many chemical groups to control bed bugs. And we don't have organochlorides, carbon organophosphate, we don't have all these for indoor pest control. And we had a few like pyrethroids, and in the last 15 years, combo, pyrethroids, neonicotinoids, pyrroles, IGR, we don't have very many. So here in this, in, 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 in the situation with bed bugs, to ask to rotate insecticide when we don't have different things really is too topic. That's something that we don't we don't we don't have. And we don't have very many, very many, many acting ingredients that can be used. Along with this, insecticide resistance has been demonstrated insecticide resistance in bed bugs, and there is a, a big deal of research that has been produced. We insecticide resistant to pyrethroids, to neonicotinoids, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say very much about this thing that's published, and we do know that bed bugs are resistant to bed bugs, and it's very difficult to find susceptible bed bugs in the field. Literally, I have found one population susceptible to bed bugs in 20 years. So it's very common. There are reports not only here in America, but also in Australia, in Europe, and Africa. So that's very common. I want to say, at this moment, at what to speak about liquid insecticide? That's the question. Okay, so can we still use them or no? Well, I, I should say at this point that many of them, liquid spray, including botanical insecticides, kill by direct contact. If you hit the insect with the spray, you had a high chance to kill it. But in order to 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 hit directly, you need to find aggregation. That's, that's what becomes very important inspect, inspection, but by inspection and identify all these aggregations. There is poor residual action due to insecticide resistance. I mentioned that there is a factor here very important, which is substrate. And those, in this material is important material like fabric, wood, where they live, where they hang up. Those are the places where we need to see this material. And we have demonstrated in the lab and also in the field that these insecticides in wood, in fabric, and all these materials, they don't perform really well. Also, we need to remember that the insects have actually a very short exposure time, probably not enough to kill. Avoid an issue, behavioral issues from the animal. That's another problem that, that can be <clears throat> or have been seen. So here we have many things that, that definitely tell us that we should not rely totally on dry residue or liquid insecticide like back in uh, back in in, in, in the a century ago or in the forest when there was DDT and DDT was uh, dry residues or, or putting dry residues on the insecticide. Here today we don't have a liquid insecticide that do the same job. And which is very problematic. Another problem do yourself methods, people tend to go to get over or the counter insecticide, and that definitely worsens the problem. And look at here, this, this person applying a diatomaceous herb. I'm going to talk about diatomaceous herb because that's something that people add, and that's something that uh, should not be used. 
as we well have led to uh, many cases of poisoning have been reported by CDC and bedo infestation often are treated they say with insecticide but the problem with insecticide resistant that lead that uh, lead people to excessive use of insecticides or use of insecticide contrary to the label direction and this can raise potential for human uh, toxicity. So th that's, that's real, and there are many cases of poisoning. So that definitely is a big problem that we have. With all these factors, lack of awareness, lack of education, social stigma, all these problems I'm mentioning, that lead to a delay intervention of these cases of bed bug infestation. And when there is a delay intervention, the bed bugs continue to spread. spread. That's why it's very important extension and education, which is very critical to reduce the spread of bed bugs. Extension and education in different languages. We had to see the population, the, the, the type of population we have in different languages, in Spanish and other languages, that is extremely important. Do, are, are we offering this information? Is ready readily available? Are we training? When we're training properly, these communities, I think that's gonna be very important. All right. So, I want to highlight in the integrated pest management where all these components, uh, we, we need to emphasize more in education to resident staff, landlords about all this, how bed bugs look like, how to do things to do, things that should not be doing, also emphasizing monitoring programs, early detection using canine detection, interceptors, visual inspection, or a combination of them, along with chemicals. I think that chemicals, there are some issues with chemicals, but still we can use. Uh, I'm going to talk about that. I think that is something that we need to emphasize a little bit more. Biological insects, I'm going to mention that. Of course, there are no chemicals, methods that uh, I'm not going to emphasize too much here because that's something that's going to take some time. But I say that encasement, mattresses, heat, say for vacuum washing, that all these things need to be uh, used combinedly. Let me talk about insecticide dust, and I, I, I consider insecticide dust as a definitely a viable, viable alternative for residual action, something that we don't have with liquid sprays. And I want to highlight that uh, it, it's a, a viable alternative because dust has physical properties that enable them to be picked up by a crawling insect. So an insect that crawls on a tree surface, they can pick up readily this material and, and it, it can be effective and generally it's effective and maintain this effectiveness as residual deposit for months and years. That's something that we know. And there are many insecticide formulations used for bed bug control. Generally, this is a um, uh, that, that has the active ingredient like pyrethroid and also there are some neonicotinoids and also has some inorganic materials, can be silica gel and some other this type of thing. So the material is this, we need to remember that they are not meant to be applied in human contact surfaces. We need to read the label, but still I consider them very useful for places where they can be applied, like electric outlet, like in the box screen, in the headboard. All these places uh, are, are, uh, can be applied, and we need to use, of course, uh, um, personal protection, and also we need to read the label, because many of these materials definitely they 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 have different instructions directions to be applied so that's something that we need to be aware that cannot be applied for example in a mattress that's something that we cannot do baseboards um a proper equipment and there is a, i think there are many of these tools now that can be used and in that way we don't overuse this material we apply in the way it should be i had to mention that we don't need to load this uh, this environment with this material we need to vacuum so excessive use but i think uh, applying this in very specific places in places where we know they hide and they are harborages and i think that can be can be something that can help to manage bed bug infestations I would like to say something about diatomies herb because there are many questions about diatomies herb. And they, they are very popular because people can go online and buy they, they, are, they, they are known to be low toxicity to, to humans. Eco-friendly alternative, but many people like it as a do-it-yourself remedy for bed bugs. And studies show that in the lab, continuous force, uh, continuous exposure of bed bugs in in, 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 in the lab might kill the, or kill the bug within 
three or four days, and that's something has been done in the lab. But there is already evidence in the field that the use of diatomic earth is not effective, and still people are using, still using, and that's something that definitely shouldn't not be done. Look at this book. Totally covered with that to Miss Earl and feeding four days after exposure to that to Miss Earl. Two weeks later, still biting. Is there is not this an evidence that that to Miss Earl is not working? Again, there's also field evidence two weeks later. So here we had a nymph fully engorged, and the conclusion here is the presence of host which provide the blood, counter the effect of the atomic herb, and they can survive. I'm not saying that atomic herbs is totally useless, but has been demonstrated, for example, in Spain, that the atomic herb can be used in baked units, along with heat, structural heat treatment. That's an option. Of course, it's going to take probably longer, but uh, that's an option. But it seems that when the host is present, that Ms. Earl is no a viable, viable alternative for vector control. There is also a, there are some oil material like silico gel. This is the, uh, one that has been you know, already in the market, has been used in China, and that's something that has been now promoted, a, a, has been start to be used in Latin America and Central America in Mexico. And this is kind of kind of a silica gel and this probably chin checks. But there are some other materials like Mexan, we know Cimexa. And this is this show, this is a laboratory study that Cimexa killed all bed bugs within one day. But this year the mortality 100 percent within one day and they compare them with that of Earth. Again, this is laboratory studies, but Dr. Mike Porter from the University of Kentucky demonstrated that in the field, it was a high reduction of bed bugs and bed bugs using CMEXA. So this CMEXA silico gel is an option. Again, we need to know how to use it. We need to read the labels and we need to apply the adequate amount to reduce the excessive exposure of humans to this material. Stephen Doggett, Dr. Stephen Doggett from Australia, also uh, tested chin checks. This is the silica gel, and he showed this is laboratory study, kill 100% predator resistant the bug within three days. So this is an option because that kill quickly, and that's something that we want, and also for long residual action, something that that's what definitely we need. How this material is applied, and that's something that can be an issue because people are, are used to apply. Or, or I used to apply this uh, with uh, sprays and uh, liquid spray. And if some people don't don't see somebody applying liquid spray, they feel that they are not doing anything. But this material and the rec recommendation to apply CMEX and all this is with a makeup brush, a very fine layer of makeup brush. Might be you not know, in those places, especially box spring, headboards, baseboards in the electric outlets. Those are places. That material can be there and can be used there to control active bed bug infestation and have been proposed preventive as a preventing method for bed bugs. I should say that it's extremely, extremely effective. It might take only 30 or 40 seconds of contact of the insect to be killed. I have been proposed, I think Dr. Dini Miller once, and she demo, she showed that this was with that to Miss Herb at that time, and she was proposing that preventive treatments uh, in very specific places will apply that. So in that way, uh, when the, there's an introduction of it, but, well, this task is waiting there. Very controversial, I know. Many people are not, uh, and many people do not agree with this method because it's going to be a uh, more per permanent exposure, but that's something that needs to be discussed. Other residual options, well, there is a, a biological-based product like Bavaria Siena that I've been using agriculture, and this has been, it was uh, registered in 2017, and basically the spore of bed bugs attached to the legs, let's say to the body of the insect when the bug cross areas treated with this material called commercially apprehend. And this spore germinate, penetrate the cuticle and kill the bed bug, 
and they have to have a specialized uh, device to apply this material. Again, these are in very specific place, very specific place where the insect uh, live or where they are likely to walk on that through the surface. And this is a picture that that was shared by Pennsylvania State, and they show bedbug bed killed by apprehend. There's no fungal outgrown, but when they put this in a in a in an area with a closed container, a high humidity, you see that they, all these things grow. Anyway, have been demonstrated that that is very effective. They claim that they control existing bed bug infestations, and they promote also the lia prevention treatment. Okay, when it's applied to bed frames, headboard, bug screen, and all these places where we know a bed bug aggregate. And also they claim that they're very effective for up to three months. And that's pretty much based on laboratory studies, but they know few studies still they validate this claim. But I think it's worth checking this because again, we need to have something residual that help us to control this resistant bed bug uh, populations. <laughs> I need to emphasize here about IPN, uh, this uh, IPN uh, concept for bed bug, and then uh, and, and saying that that there are three components: uh, detection and prevention, chemicals and no chemicals. But when we had we had implemented a uh, integrated panel for bed bug, we have been pretty much using these two chemicals and no chemicals, and have been already experienced that when we use chemicals and no chemicals in a reactive approach this program still fail, and that has been demonstrated. And here there is a study from Dr. Wan and group in Rutgers University, and they compared, they selected different apartments that fuel still is very valuable, fuel size in a group of apartments, they, they use no chemical methods. In the second group, insecticides only, and the third group, integrate pest management, including both no chemical and insecticides. And they demonstrate in this study, study that after 10 weeks, there were an elimination from those three, three, three treatments, 70, 67, 33, and 40% of the apartment. They were eliminated. That means there was no uh, satisfactory control from some of these places still were very effect, ineffective, these treatments, even though they use IPM and all these chemicals and no chemical methods. I, the traditional IPM. What was the conclusion? Lack of cooperation of the resident largely contributed to eliminate this population in these places. So notice here that we have been demonstrated that the IPM is applied by still all of these fails here. <clears throat> so this group in Rutgers uh, University, they propose community-wide bed bug management programs. In this case, instead of using a reactive approach, to act when, when people call that they have a problem. The approach here is early detection of bed bugs to proactive, a proactive approach. So where we need, the idea is to catch the bed bug infestation or to prevent or to detect this bed bug infestation. And that way we can catch this problem earlier. And the basic of this program is Education of resident, the resident staff need to be involved with education, biology, control, prevention. That's something that's really important. And I think that's what makes the difference to emphasize in this concept of prevention, prevention and monitoring. Monitoring aspect, let's use those tools that we do not work and monitoring. I think that that's something the base of all these things. And these are, this is the program, this is something I, I, I'm, and seminal paper on the use of these models, community web based management programs in affordable housing. And they show that IPM program resulted in 98% of reduction in bedbug counts among the three apartments and reduced infestation from 15% to 2.2% after two, 12 months. So definitely it's a, a significant reduction of infestation in these places. Now you wonder how much that costs. And then, this is an, an insert from, from the paper. This is the annual average cost for Belmont management at Berry Gardens during the two years prior to the study was around 57,000 per year and failed to manage bed bugs. This program 
where was implemented the community community wide that was implemented that cost sixty five thousand. They were had different, but it was a dramatic reduction. So we are talking about pretty much similar number fifty seven sixty five thousand. All right. So uh, the conclusion of the of the author in this paper they predict that bed bond management will decrease in following years. So this is a proposal. This something has been proposed. Of course, there are many challenges, and one of the challenges is convincing managers for the adoption of this comprehensive, comprehensive bed bond IPM program. A lot to do: education, convincing, field studies. We need to talk a lot with people. So in that way, we we try to convince them because I think that's the way we try. That's the way we. We can try to reduce the impact of bed bug, especially in low income housing. The people people are there suffering, and there's no very major. We need to come up with something, something practical, something that we can do in order to be effective. And we need to understand also that, of course, there is economic restriction, economic problems, and now. I, but we need to do something here. We need to demonstrate. We need to talk with people. So in that way, again. We reduce the impact of this space. I want to stop here. I would like to give chance for people to make questions. And I want to thank everybody for the attention to this seminar. Thank you. OK, thank you, Alvaro. <laughs> Let's uh, take one or two questions in person first, and then we'll uh, we'll, we'll open it up to the, uh, the Zoom audience. Um, any any questions here? Uh, I, I I can ask one if not. Uh, okay. Um, so yeah, uh, Alvaro, I was curious about the heat treatment and um, wondering, um, you know, how long residents would need to leave their 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 home um, in order for the heat to to uh, to to do its work on the the bed bugs. Okay, good. I think the length of the time is gonna depend on how long it's gonna take. Generally, it's five, six hours, depend on the size. The size, but uh, yeah, this is a very short period of time. There is no, there is no issue with, of course, toxicity because of heat treatment. But uh, generally, this uh, it take about five, six hours, depend on the temperature. But again, the re-entry is gonna be pretty quick because there is no problem. But I would say that the, within within six hours, they they can come back. That's the question, right? Okay, is, gotcha. I, right. I I was envisioning just kind of turning up the heat in the house to you know to raise the overall temperature to kind of facilitate the desiccation of the insects. Yeah. But it, it sounds right. like it's more of a direct application. No, definitely. I mean, I didn't mention that, but you have to use the structural uh, structural heat treatment and increasing the the temperature in the thermostat is not going to do anything. That temperature is not going to kill. Has to be with a very special equipment. Has to be some sort of preparation. Has to be a very high temperatures, okay, above uh, 55 Celsius degree. But no, you cannot uh, increase the temperature with the thermostat. But that's not going to work. It's definitely, you have to have very special light uh, uh, equipment. Uh, also, it's very important to have. Uh, uh, probes or something to measure the temperature specifically in some hard to reach places because this temperature need to these little temperatures should reach places where they are hiding. So that's that's complex and is is expensive. But again, it is very effective. Of course, it doesn't afford doesn't provide residual action, but perhaps the most effective method to control bed bugs. Great, thank you. Okay, let's take some questions from online participants. Um, go ahead and unmute yourself or feel free to type your question into the chat box. Um, I see a question in the chat, I'll read it out. Um, uh, Josh asks, can you comment on the latest research with bag bugs and is it Chagas? Chagas? Of course. Yeah, look, with the um, with the role of bed bugs in transmitting pathogens, um, definitely, I should say initially that there is no evidence. There is no evidence that they transmit uh, pathogens in natural conditions. All these studies that have been shown about shagas and other pathogens 
And there are uh, experimental laboratory studies where people, and even my group in 2016, I think, infected some bed bugs with blood infected with Trypanosoma cruzi, the agent that called Chagas, and you put that in the in the in the in a blood in the feeder, and they suck up the blood and all that. Um, but this is part of the story, and they screen this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, the protozoan is creating the feces and all that, and, and yeah, that can happen. The pathogen, uh, the insect harbor, the pathogen, and all that they maintain daily. But that's on, that's all, again part of the story. But but there's no evidence, few evidence that they are transmitting. Uh, Chaga or Trypanosoma cruzi and other pathogens to in the field. So there is no epidemiological evidence that associate outbreak of diseases with outbreak of, of bed bugs. So today, what I say, there is no evidence, scientific evidence that show that bed bugs transmit pathogen. Of course, we need to keep checking, especially when there are outbreak of diseases and bed bugs to see, but we need to keep an eye on that. But at this moment, Definitely, there is no evidence. Great, thank you. Okay, next question from Hillary. I think the concept of interceptors is awesome. Is there any work being done for monitoring tools uh, for bed bugs hiding in other locations like sticky traps, et cetera? Well, <clears throat> Uh, with the sticky traps, um, no, uh, definitely there is no, we don't rely very much on the sticky trap in the information that sticky traps can provide when they deploy sticky trap. I mean, there are very few people and 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 definitely sticky traps is not the best option to, to use uh, as a monitoring. Um, and I think that the best option here is interceptor, especially those interceptor where we can add something like carbon dioxide, which is a, an active interceptor. I think that that's a, that's something that um, is done. With the sticky traps, um, I have seen many people send me pictures with sticky, sticky, sticky traps with loaded with, with bed box, but again, these sticky traps have been placed in in, in residences, places where it's heavily infested with bed bugs. So it's easy to get bed bugs in a sticky trap when there are bed bugs everywhere. So we need tools definitely that detect low infestation of bed bugs. So in that way, we can address this problem early. Okay, great. And uh, Rick, Rick asks, is there a place in bed bug management for low cost, information-based do-it-yourself DIY, uh, particularly for low-level infestations? Yes, they are, but uh, I don't know how I can share, this, but, but there is, a, yeah, there are some, of course, there are some places, uh, do-yourself methods that can be used. Uh, there is, a, in the in the Western, we had a, we had a special website that I might share it later. I don't know how, but yeah, definitely there are some methods because this is going to be very important. Do yourself, and 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 there is information I think that that can be shared later. Uh, there is information there. Do yourself methods, and it's important the information because people know exactly what to do themselves and what not to do because there are many things that people don't do. But again, at this moment, I don't know if exactly. I mean, I cannot point exactly, but. But if if Rick uh, email me, uh, I can I can find that information and, and share and tell exactly where it is. Right. Okay. Interceptor so what makes interceptor so attractive? I'm sorry. What's it, why are interceptors so attractive? No, they hey Andrew, the interceptors uh, the interceptors are so attractive. Particularly when this uh, carbon dioxide is added, carbon dioxide acts as a stimulant. Let's say increase the locomotory activity, and uh, more than attractant, I think that has to do with with this uh, carbon dioxide increasing the activity. And the more the bed bug walks in a place, the more chance to get trapped in these interceptors. The interceptors without carbon dioxide. Of course, this by itself is not attractive. But again, these uh, these uh, these interceptors placed under the legs uh, 
uh, is going to be important because when they are uh, placed under the leg, the base is going to be the human, and, and then that's going to be good. But Dr. Wan in Rogers has demonstrated, for example, that deploying many of these stra interceptors around the room and uh, it can be very effective. So, in conclusion, the interceptors himself, themselves are not very attractive. It's just because of the deployment of massive deployment of this uh, make that the encounter of these materials by bed box is higher. Did that answer your question, Dr. Sutherland? Uh, I guess so. Um, All right. <laughs> so, um, since we're talking about interceptors, um, could interceptors be combined with a, uh, a control such as silica dioxide uh, as part of the overall approach, Abby asks? Yes, I, I think that interceptors themselves, um, I, I generally have been added some talks from kind of dust there, so in that way, they, and reduce the chance that the, the bed bugs, when they fall in that well, uh, they don't walk up. But uh, I would say that that's, you don't need to apply necessarily something more than talc. They just get trapped in there and, and you don't need necessarily to kill them and they might die by starvation. But talc is enough. And this place is going to be, the box are going to be there and they might not escape. And I think you don't need to add, let's say, a, a silica gel, things like that. It's just the interceptor itself with some tal that should be enough. Okay, great. Um, maybe uh, maybe the final question here. Um, uh, do you have other ideas um, for uh, other tools to detect low levels of bed bugs? <laughs> Look, there have been many ideas, but more than detection to control, and we have been discussing this a lot with Dr. Kobe Shaw from North Carolina State University as our liquid base for bed bugs. I think that that's a concept in which combine uh, many things, including a liquid, a liquid that include uh, some some sort of toxicant and phago stimulant, but this liquid need to be warmed up. And, and again, more than for, for detention, more than detention is for controlling bed bugs. Uh, this is, um, I like the idea, the thing is implementing this idea because we have to have something unconspicuous, effective, small, and that's something that definitely, I still I like the idea, but, but we need to work more on that. As far as detection itself, it's challenging because we had to come up with something that definitely is more attractive than a hose. And that's not easy. We need to have something cheap, unconspicuous. We need something that warm, uh, something that definitely attracts. So I, I think this is the feature of, of bed bug research, you know, detection, that they have uh, effective detection tools and that and we don't have we don't have something definitely that is cheap, practical, and and what we are uh, uh, proposing is 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 quite expensive, quite time consuming, things like that. But having an effective trap, I think that's going to be something that that might change the situation or the history of bed box, Something that we don't have at this point. Okay, great. Um, Thank you, Dr. Romer. I have one more question, and it's, it's in relation to, uh, it's interesting to see that they are moving into those electrical, those power, power outlets. Is there an, any electrical stimuli that is attracting those bed bugs to that area? It's interesting uh, to see that it seems to me very common. All right. The question is, uh, bed bugs colonizing these electric outlets and why, right? Correct. Is there, if there is any electrical, any stimuli that is attracting those to, to those areas? Nobody has looked at into that issue, but I feel that pretty much uh, they are looking for, uh, they, are, they are locating or colonizing these places because there are no, there is, a, there is not very much light there and it's a place to hide and not become evident, you know? So I think that it is because they have a place there to hide and there's not very much light. They are photophobic and all that. that that's a good place for them. Great. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions. Um, so let's uh, give 
Alvaro, uh, one more uh, final applause and uh, thank him for going through such such struggles yesterday and hopefully not today with uh, with travel and uh, it's such an excellent presentation. I think we all learned a lot. Um, there are also some some great resources that um, uh, some uh, New York State IPM uh, folks put in the chat to be sure to check out. And um, that'll lead you to our website where the information for the next uh, seminars in this series are posted. Um, so if there's anyone with a special interest in bed bugs or, or meeting uh, with Alvaro and, and, and chatting um, uh, kind of more candidly, uh, you're welcome to stick around. Otherwise, um, this will be uh, the end of the, the formal presentation. Thank you, Dr. Brown. I think that's going to be very important that, uh, yeah, definitely to, to tell people uh, about the resources available for Bedbox. It's a lot of information there and, and something that definitely we need to share, we need to change because, uh, yeah, the information is there and, and we need to use it. Great. And I see you, you put your email into the chat. So that's wonderful. I, I think there was a, a, a high level of uh, a bed bug interest. Uh, online, I, I know that Jody had sent out the uh, the announcement to a, a, a bed bug listserv that that kind of reached far and wide. So, yeah, I had good uh, good turnout today. And uh, yeah, if, if there's anyone still online who uh, wants to chat um, more candidly with Alvaro, uh, you're welcome to unmute. I do have a question I didn't get to ask earlier. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I know you said that uh, there's still some field work that needs to be done to assess that claim about apprehend having a three month residual in the field. Um, have you heard any concerns or what do you know about possible concerns about having a fungal product in a place where people are living and sleeping? Is anyone concerned about allergic reactions or, or human exposure to the fungal spores? Hi, Amara. Yeah, definitely there are concerns. There's some biological uh, control agent that are out there and concern exists, of course. But again, this was a, that's something that I was, this product was registered and they, in the label rate, they show all these things and how to, to reduce the impact, let's say the human exposure and, and all these things. They, so I think that the concern is exists, of course, but that's something that this material needs to be applied properly and, and in the way there is a reducing path. But yes, of course, there was concern. And this material was yeah, registered in 2017 and need to be applied properly to reduce that impact. Thank you. Right. Anyone else want to just say hi or uh, or have a comment or question? Oh, I have something. Hi, hi, Alvaro. Yes. Hey, um, I'm in Nebraska. I deal with a lot of the bed bugs. I'm in extension. Do you, when it comes to like local resources, do you know of like, is it mostly like maybe church organizations that are willing to help with community members to help prepare for? That's a question uh, I get a lot or like, cause I, they're, they're asking me for money and I don't have any money for, you know, treatments or products. So are there any like task force or anything that you've helped organize in communities that may help people treat for bed bugs? Jody, they might assist, but I know where, I mean, you have to look at, you know, us in, in your, in Nebraska in, in locally to see if there is any group, but yeah, perhaps I, I'm not, I'm not aware of the specific groups, national groups or local groups that can assist and help with this because definitely <laughs> this, that, that would be great. We had this group and help to prepare and help people, especially low income housing to, to do especially preparation in that the case to, to make mm -hmm. an effective application or effective treatment against bed bugs. Have you ever been asked to give these kinds of presentations to potential task force willing to do that? No. No? Okay. I was just wondering. Thank you. Nice to see you. You too. I would like to follow up on Jody's question. Um, there's a lot of money out there that could 
help with um, asthma conditions? And I know there was some indication that people might be allergic um, to the casting off or the feces. Is, is there any been, is there a smoking gun yet showing a clear asthma bed bug connection? Very good. Thank for your comment. Um, I think it was more of a, a question. Maybe, <laughs> maybe the, the uh, internet might I was might assuming have... from that that you don't have an answer. Yeah, I don't, uh, exactly. Yeah, thank for the, that. That's, that's a right interpretation. Yeah, I, I'm, no, I'm, I'm not aware of that. I think that that's a question for, for Dr. Dini Miller or Dr. Juan. I think that's, that, 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 that would be a question, a good question for them, that they are pretty much immersed in areas that definitely, you know, these, these things can apply. But no, yeah, I, I'm not aware of that. Of that. Sorry. <laughs> I actually have another question. Um, you showed the very adorable hound a few times, and you mentioned the um, variation in the effectiveness of them being able to um, determine whether there actually is or is not bed bugs, and that we should look for reputable companies. Do you have any recommendations on how to make sure that somebody is reputable? And you have to look at, I mean, they, they should demonstrate the training plan and the records. I think that when you have a pest control company, a pest control company or this kind of industry, you have to ask for record and also reference. I think that would be the general recommendation. But yeah, there are many, there are many companies out there that they are um, promising good things and all that, but we had to see that they are doing an actual, uh, really a good job because there are many people talking uh, and those dogs are not very effective. They're abused and we have to look at that because that, 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 that and they are expensive. Right. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Well, Alvaro, thank you for your time and uh, sharing your, your experience and, and uh, excellent research with us. And, uh, I wish you safe travels and, and everyone uh, out there today who's in uh, snowy, the snowy north, um, safe travels. And uh, yeah, thank you all for, for coming.